Hey everybody, today I'm out in Utah finally driving the 2024 Ranger, and this is the ultimate expression of the Ranger. It's the new Ranger Raptor. It's the first time the Ranger has ever received the Raptor treatment in North America. And for this model year, it has some pretty stiff competition in the United States, but the off-road competitors, they aren't the same kind of off-road machine as the Ranger Raptor. So in this video, we'll talk about the Ranger Raptor, how it stacks up against the Chevy, the GMC, and of course the Toyota competition, why you might choose one of these over one of those, or vice versa. So what makes this Ranger a Raptor? Well, clearly there is a style difference between this and the regular Ranger, but at its core, it's a fairly different vehicle because Ford makes some really substantial changes underneath the skin. And that means this is a little bit different than the other off-road oriented trims we find in competitive Toyota or General Motors trucks, say the new Trail Hunter or the TRD Pro or the AEV or the Bison editions of the Colorado and Canyon. This receives a unique frame, unique suspension components, we get a unique engine under the hood as well, so lots more changes than we find in those vehicles. So if you're looking for the ultimate off-road truck in the midsize segment, I would argue it's the Ranger Raptor. Oddly enough, it's not the most expensive though. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's dive into the styling here. Clearly we have full LED headlights here, LED high beams and LED low beams, also LED turn signals. At the bottom of the bumper, we do find a plastic insert there around the parking sensors, but the bulk of this is steel, of course, and we get skid plates underneath, recovery hooks tucked in nicely there. The radar sensor for the adaptive cruise control, it's right there in the middle. It looks like that's positioned and installed in a way that it could be easy to move if you put an aftermarket bumper on your Ranger Raptor. Now, moving around to the side, you're going to notice the pretty big fender flares, and they did them in metal. They're not tacked on fender flares like we find in a Bronco Raptor. Now, speaking of Bronco Raptor, the reason we don't find clearance lights up front, but we do find some little cut-ins where you could add them if you wanted to, is that this is narrower than a Bronco Raptor, definitely narrower than an F-150 Raptor. So if you're worried about the size on trails, etc., you might want to consider this. Obviously, it's longer than a Bronco Raptor, however, so it is going to have a slightly larger turning radius because of the longer wheelbase that we see here. Interior dimensions, they're obviously going to be a little bit different than the Raptor, a Bronco Raptor specifically, I should say, depending on exactly what you want to put inside, but we have the practicality of the big cargo bed behind. Important thing to know with the 2024 Ranger is that it's only going to come one way, exactly as you're seeing it here, with the short bed behind the big cab. There's no two-door cab version of this at all in the Ranger lineup in North America and no long bed behind. If you want something like that, you're going to have to shop elsewhere. The reason Ford did this is because this is the kind of vehicle most people buy in this segment. They want the big cab, of course. Again, fender flares back here, really well integrated into the sheet metal of the body. They didn't just simply bolt on a big bubble here. They completely restructured the outside of the bed. Now, the inside of the bed, however, that is exactly the same as the regular Ranger. We have a damped tailgate there. Nice touch. We have places where you can put clamps there. So if you want to use this as a work surface, you can clamp stuff to the face here. We have the built-in ruler there. We have some power ports over there on the other side. And of course, your option of different bed liners, whether you want a spray-in bed liner or a slide-in bed liner, etc. There are also some mounting points on top. Now, if I close the tailgate here, you'll notice that the tailgate looks kind of similar to the regular Ranger, but we have different taillights on the outside. These are certainly more premium. They are now full LEDs in this model. One thing that I thought was kind of weird of the, with the regular Ranger is that the turn signals and the backup lights, those are incandescent bulbs here. Everything is an LED and the bottom part of this light is actually filled in. In the regular Ranger, just the top section is illuminated. The bottom section is a reflector. Going down here, obviously again, full steel bumper down here, huge recovery hooks. Just check out the size of those. Twin exhaust tips there. Towing capacity, it does go down to just over 5,500 pounds from 7,500 pounds maximum in the other versions of the Ranger. And then we have the towing uh, wiring harnesses here. This is the one thing I find a little bit odd. This module sticks down a reasonable amount from the bottom end of the vehicle. I kind of wish they'd put the wiring harness connections up above. I could see myself maybe grinding those to a, to a little nub if I'm out on a trail somewhere. Uh, but of course, some of these other sections are just a little bit lower, so that may offer you a little bit of extra protection. Now, as we move around to this side of the vehicle, we have approximately 33 inch tires on this model. Interesting twist, when we started talking to the engineers last night, they said you can actually fit 35s in the rear without modification, 
35 inch tire will fit under there in the spare tire well. So you can actually carry that 35 inch spare tire with you. But up front, you will need a little bit of a suspension modification to get 35s to fit properly on the vehicle. Now, obviously Ford didn't want to go into too many specifics since they're not providing 35s from the factory, but if you do plan on modifying your truck, that's a really handy feature, especially the fact that the uh, frame rails were redesigned in order to allow that bigger spare tire in the rear. Now that was possible because this uses a unique frame under the body. Part of the reason for that unique frame is up front with the adaptive suspension system, the wider cradle for the bigger engine, and then some of it's back here because instead of leaf springs, we find coils in the rear. That actually makes this one of the best riding Rangers in the lineup, something we certainly noticed out on the road. The other thing you'll notice is actually way back down here. Behind the rear differential, we find a Watts link rather than a Panhard bar. That's of course because we have a different kind of off-roading mission in mind for the Raptor, and since they were changing the rear suspension geometry anyway for the coil springs, they might as well just redesign everything specifically for this kind of off-road duty. Obviously, the other change happens up front, which is why we find those twin exhaust tips in the back. So let's go ahead and dive under the hood and see what's happening under here. In this segment, V6s are dying a slow death except for in the Ranger, where we find two new V6s for 2024. Well, not new, just new to the Ranger. The first one is the 2.7 liter twin turbo six borrowed out of the F-150. Under this hood, it produces 315 horsepower. You'll find that as an option in the XLT and the Lariat trim. The Raptor that we're here to talk about, this gets the three liter turbo from the Bronco Raptor, twin turbos, of course, 405 horsepower, 430 pound-feet of torque. Some of you might be thinking, hang on, there are competitive trucks that will deliver over 400 pound-feet of twist. And that is certainly true, but the way that they deliver that power is certainly gonna be a little bit different. In the General Motors Twinsies, we find a four-cylinder turbo engine with a smaller displacement. So the torque curve is not gonna be quite as broad, the engine is certainly not as smooth, and because it's a single turbo, it just doesn't have the same kind of torque delivery characteristics that we find here. Then of course we have the 10 speed automatic transmission, which we don't find at all in the competition. The four wheel drive system, that's basically been borrowed out of the Bronco Raptor as well. So it's a full time unit with a two low mode. So you can put it just in rear wheel drive if you want to, to save gas. There's also a four time full wheel drive mode. I mean a full time four wheel drive mode. Apparently I'm tripping over my tongue here. In addition to four high and four low and front and rear lockers, of course, as well. There aren't too many options in this segment that will give you lockers in the back and lockers in the front, but the Ranger is now one of them. The front seats are a little bit different than in the regular Ranger, but the seat geometry is pretty similar. So the driver is generally speaking gonna sit a little bit higher off the ground than we find in the new Tacoma even, giving this a bit more of a truck-like feel, certainly more upright than we find in the Toyota. Part of that's possible because we don't get a sunroof even optional in the Ranger. If you want one of those, you're gonna have to look towards the competition or beg Ford to add one because Ford has said it's not impossible. They just chose not to do it in this model. Now, if you take a look at the seat itself, I'll actually hop in the back seat so Travis can zoom in there. You'll notice that the seat design itself is different than the regular Ranger. We have a lot more bolstering here on the sides. Of course, we have the contrasting piping, contrasting stitching, contrasting inserts here. Little bit of faux suede going on right there and right there, also right there uh, between your legs down here on the seat bottom cushion. My only worry about that is that this is going to pill over time. That's one of the things that Alcantara does. But the steering wheel, that's a leather wrapped model that we'll take a look at in a bit. Let me uh, sit behind myself here. Had a lot of questions over on our Facebook page. If you haven't found us over there, be sure to, about rear seat room. It's essentially the same as the regular Ranger, even though these seats are a little bit different in terms of their general design. You'll notice we have a little bit of a dish out there for your legs, but leg room is honestly pretty similar in all of the midsize truck competition in the US, except for two options. That would be the Honda and the Jeep. That's because they're very different in their dimensions and their there's particular mission as well. So pretty similar room to the Frontier, the Tacoma, the Colorado, the Canyon, etc. One weird twist, no air vents back here for the rear passengers. I do think that's kind of an odd touch. Also um, a little bit unexpected, not necessarily in the best way, is that the rear bench is a 100% folding model. So I can flip that up. And as you can see, I have two storage bins under there. I can also flip the seat back down if I wanted to put luggage on it. But then obviously song and dance around in here, 
this becomes a two-person truck because you can't do anything back here. Back here is where we find a subwoofer and the jack for the vehicle, the tire iron that's actually under the seat bottom cushion. Headroom is pretty decent in the back, and that's because, again, no sunroof is going on back here. So with my head all the way back on that headrest, my hair is definitely touching the ceiling. In case you're wondering why my hair is crazy, it's because we've had helmets on all day, so definitely have helmet head today. And uh, now let's get out and talk about the dashboard because we see some changes there for the Raptor as well. Starting back there in the rear, we have Travis. How's your headroom back there? Uh, I'm in the roof. I sit vertical, but I have a very tall torso. Overall, I think the space is pretty good. Here's a better look at the front headrests. They are of a different design than we find in the rest of the Ranger lineup. Obviously, height adjustable shoulder belts over there. Raptor spelled out in red right there under that headrest. Over here on the ceiling, we find a row of auxiliary switches. That's a handy place to put them, I think. And then we have a sunglass holder just behind that. We have sun visors that do slide side to side. That's also a nice touch. Moving back down to the passenger seat, there's another look at that bolstering. And I should mention that the passenger seat seat bottom cushion, even in this trim, does not adjust for tilt. And it's a decent amount lower than the driver's seat. So I did find that less comfortable than the seat that we find over there on the driver's side. Now moving over to the door panels, we find the more premium interior touch points on this interior uh, that you also find in the upper trims of the rest of the Ranger lineup. So soft touch upper section, soft touch insert right there in the middle, and soft armrest harder plastics down below. Then we get to some of the more unique Ranger Raptor touches, like the orange rings there around the air vents. I really love the air vent styles on this vehicle. Moving along the dashboard, we find some unique trim. This has kind of a golf ball, golf ball style texture there. Uh, then two glove boxes, a small one just above. We then find a storage slot in the middle, and then a bin style glove compartment just below that. Then in the middle of everything, we find the bigger touchscreen available in the Ranger. You can get this with either a 10-inch touchscreen or this really tall one that we find in this model. Here's a better look at those air vents. You can see that those two little sort of twin exhaust tip looking things actually move in pairs on the air vent. That's a really cool design touch, I think, personally. As you can see, we get CarPlay or Android Auto integration right there in the middle. And then the bottom portion of the screen is always reserved for some system functions, some direct access buttons right there in the middle, including some trailering functions. Again, keep in mind, trailering is actually gonna be a little bit reduced because the payload goes down thanks to the rear suspension changes. And then we get some physical controls that back up some of those controls above. So you can adjust your temperature here, or you can use the slider on the touchscreen. Then down from there, we get a little bit of extra storage space. You can see Qi wireless charging mat. I can barely put my large iPhone in there and actually have it right there on the charging area. So some of the larger smartphones may have troubles. Over here, we have a small storage area, USB-C and USB-A ports. You can opt for wireless or wired CarPlay. Then we have actually my, my least favorite shifter in the Ranger. This is the sort of digital shifter here. It's the low profile one's probably the best way to think of it. Here's a view from the top. That unlock button's right up there. This button over here on this side that might seem like a more natural unlock button, that's the manual mode button. So if you're in drive and you want to toggle between manual and drive, you just hit that button right there. This is not a joystick style shifter like we find in some vehicles. It actually moves and stays up there in park, down there to drive. Over there, we have two big cup holders in a stacked formation, one just in front of the other. Down here, we find a button unique to the Raptor. It's nestled amongst the autonomous parking, stability control, and the auto start stop disable button. If we go back up to the screen here, it's gonna give us this off-road screen mode where we have access to the 360 degree camera system. It's by default gonna give us a forward view camera, and then we get off-road status pages down here. So this is where you're gonna activate the rear locker and the front locker. I do think it's odd that they are on the screen rather than physical buttons. I would have preferred a physical button personally. We also get tire pressure monitoring, and as you can see right there, indications when those lockers are active. This is the all-terrain progress mode button right there, and then you can turn off the parking sensors over there on that side. Going back here to the center console, this is where we find the controls for the drive modes and the four-wheel drive system. So four auto, two high, four low, four high right there. And you rotate this around and then you have to keep doing that if you want to go to the various different drive modes. Those are shown over here on the instrument cluster. It is quite a number of twists to go all the way from one side to the other. And then it doesn't just wrap around. So I can't keep turning this counterclockwise to get all the way back over there to that off-road mode. Between the front seats, we have a thickly padded center armrest, decent amount of storage space in there. Keep in mind, this is a mid-sized truck with a big transmission and transfer case under there, so you're not gonna get as much storage room as you'd find in a half-ton truck 
or in some mid-size crossovers. Now, if we go back over here yet again to the driver's side instrument cluster, you'll notice that the software is actually kind of similar to the other Raptor vehicles in Ford's lineup. We get a lot of auxiliary gauges up top, and it's decently configurable. You can run through a number of options right there on that screen using this toggle over here on the right side of the steering wheel. Now, speaking of the steering wheel, it's not borrowed out of the F-150 or the Raptor. It's borrowed out of, of course, the other world markets where we find a, uh, a Ranger Raptor. And this steering wheel comes across as, you know, a little bit of a truck meets passenger car style steering wheel. These modules are definitely more similar to the passenger car wheel buttons that we find in other Fords. But then we have the four spoke design with Raptor down there at the bottom. Big magnesium paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Those are really nicely done red accent right there so you know which side of your truck is up and then over here we have controls for the adaptive cruise control system volume up down track forward backward and some raptor specific buttons of course the r raptor mode right there you can adjust the my mode settings in the uh, infotainment system and then you can adjust specific settings by going through here so you can adjust the steering normal comfort sport suspension normal sport and off-road and then you could adjust the exhaust of course baja is going to be the loudest exhaust mode The integrated trailer brake controller, that's over here to the right of the steering column, and the engine start-stop button is on this little sort of side bump or side pod because in some markets it appears that this is designed to accommodate an actual key that would go right in there. All right, everybody, so we are out on the off-road course, and I have two of the many TFLs back there in the back seats. Everybody wave. Howdy. It's right. Case, Case and Andre back there, and Andre was driving first, so it's uh, it's payback time for some of the rocks oh, yes. on this course here. Um, but yeah, so uh, essentially the big things you need to know are we have KO3s from the factory. Uh, those are a slight modification over what we saw in the KO2s. I don't have all the details with me just yet, but there's a different tread pattern. And of course, these KO3s were specifically tuned for this vehicle. So different part number. If you want the exact same KO3s after these wear out, you're gonna have to go back to your Ford dealer to get them. Next thing you should know is that some of the dimensions on this are a little bit neater and tidier than on the Bronco Raptor. So definitely one reason you might want to choose one or over the other. You'll certainly notice this is narrower out on trails like this, but then of course we have a longer wheelbase. So there are going to be places you could take this that you couldn't take the Bronco and of course vice versa. Now I got to love with you all. This is not the most technical off-road course I have ever been on. We were running this entire thing in uh, currently four high with no lockers. We've been turning on and off the trail control. Trail control could be helpful in some situations. It's sort of next generation um, uh, hill descent control in effect. So you can not just go down in a controlled fashion. It'll also take you up. So think of it as off-road cruise control, if you will. I don't like the fact that the lockers, if you take a look down here, Travis, that the lockers are buttons over here in the infotainment system. I am not the biggest fan of that location. They do work pretty well, and I like the digital indication that the axle is actually locked. Uh, of course, we can, you know, lock the front there as well. Uh, one interesting twist is that uh, I believe we have to be in, uh, oh yeah, we have to be in four low to lock the front. Uh, so, you know, you can't have that flexibility of locking them in every drive mode. And honestly, for this course, we don't even really need the rear locker to be on. That was theoretically the obstacle we needed it for and it turned it off just in time. Uh, we also get uh, tire pressure monitoring on this page, nice touch there, and of course our forward look camera with the tire direction indicated there so that you can tell exactly where those tires are going. Now the one thing I was worried about on this trail, which I can tell you with decent confidence about, is that I was worried the throttle would be a bit too touchy. That's something that I have noticed in some of Ford's Raptor products in the past. Uh, I didn't really care for the throttle mapping. I actually think they've done a really good job keeping this throttle at a point where it's easy to modulate on courses like this. Now, clearly we're in four high and it is changing gears here and there. I could put it in manual mode, of course, uh, if I wanted better control over those gear changes. And I think they've done a decent job trying to balance things out there. Four low is of course gonna give you a bit more control, but I think things might get a little bit jumpier in four low just for my personal taste. 
Now Now's a good point to talk about the dimensions of the Ranger Raptor, specifically the narrower dimensions. In some of these areas, we have these bushes and, and trees and some scratchy points that are nearby the vehicle. If we were in an F-150 Raptor especially, it would be difficult to navigate some of this course without body damage. Now, clearly, the F-150 would be just fine, but if you're buying a new truck, and especially a new fifty to $100,000 truck, which is where the Raptor line ends up, you probably don't want to end up with pinstripes your first time off-road. Now, as you'd expect in a modern off-road vehicle, we have a ton of electronic systems on this vehicle, including the progress control over here. Of course, Ford has their own special name for that, but basically use the cruise control controls to, you know, set your speed out here on this off-road course. So we could just tackle this at 11 whole miles an hour if we wanted to, but there's some decent rocks up there. And honestly, there aren't too many situations where I prefer that. I just tend to be a little bit more old school. I'm okay with the anti-lock brakes and just using my right foot. However, there are gonna be situations where that is gonna deliver more sure-footed feeling and better stopping and better speed control on some really loose surfaces than actually using the brake. So it is still a really great function to have even if you are a little bit more on the old school side of things. We of course also have electronic traction control just as you'd expect. So if you are in a situation where maybe a locker is gonna prevent you from turning as tightly as we need to in some of these areas, honestly, the traction control system is gonna be really, really well behaved here. It's gonna do a good job shuttling traction across from uh, the tires that don't have grip to the tires that do have grip. And then you have the security of the locker when you want to. So that's the trail. Let's get the Raptor out on the road now. Zero to 60 obviously is pretty quick thanks to 405 horsepower happening under the hood. This is most likely the fastest midsize truck in America, although I don't have official confirmation on that just yet. Out here at nearly 5,500 feet of elevation, we were running 0 to 60 in about 6.3 seconds. Yeah. It's a pretty respectable time. Yeah, for sure. It, and it is one of those things where because it's a twin turbo, you do want to get the, uh, the turbo spooled up before you get the best time. But once you do, this mm -hmm. thing is ready to rock it. Yeah, there's just a little bit of turbo lag. I mean, this is a very untraveled road, mind you, everybody. We are in four auto. Uh, the speed limit here is 65. If I floor it, there's just that barest hint of turbo lag, just at about 2,000 RPM, things really come on the boil, yeah. and that's where you find just heaps and heaps and heaps of torque. Uh, it has a really great feel to it, I would say, and the 10-speed automatic transmission is definitely an asset as well because the ratios are all so close together that it really keeps the engine in the meat of the power band. Yeah, it keeps pulling from as soon as that spool is up to all the way through. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're keeping at the speed limit, but this, this thing will go, and no matter where you're at, uh, speed wise, there's always a gear to get you going in mm -hmm. that proper torque curve. And it's funny, this offended a whole bunch of people, Ford people when I told them this. And I said, what do you think? Uh, I said, you know, I love it. I also think that I would love to see a street performance version of the Raptor. I think that this engine and this suspension tune actually would work really well for a more on-road focused performance truck because the other thing you're going to notice out on the road is how comfortable the suspension really is. We have yeah. the suspension now in its normal mode on-road, off-road, the adaptive dampers, the coil springs in the back, they're not just better off-road, they're also more civilized on-road. Significantly better. And even though the Ranger, you know, the updated Ranger is more comfortable, it still breaks a little bit when you hit those bumps mm -hmm. in the road, when you hit the pothole. And this does such an incredible job of eating that all up. If we could transfer at least some of that over to a street version, you know, yeah. a, a Ranger ST, um, I, I'd be interested. It's really a lot of the same sort of improvement that we find in say the Toyota Tacoma when mm -hmm. you go to the leaf spring models. You get a lot more civility on the road. That's also one of the reasons I've always liked the way the Gladiator feels. It does, it's not the greatest handling truck. You don't want to take that on a track, but yeah. the coil spring suspension, the relatively soft suspension we find in that Gladiator, actually makes for a pretty comfortable highway cruiser. It's a strange you know, juxtaposition, but the off-road mode or the off-road models are the more comfortable models yeah. on-road as well. They're not the best handling, right. but they are more comfortable. So yeah. finding a balance there, um, it'd be another feather in, in Ford's cap if they wanted to consider it. Yeah, I mean, it also applies to the F-150 Raptor. It's really comfortable as a highway cruiser. You all knew this already, I'm sure, but performance off-road vehicles have become pretty darn expensive over the last several decades, and the Raptor lineup is no exception. A Bronco Raptor is going to set you back over $90,000, and the top-end F-150 Raptor, it's crazy expensive. But this Raptor, it's a little bit different. It starts notably less expensive than a Bronco. In fact, with a base price of around $55,000 before the inevitable dealer markup, of course, you could get a Ranger Raptor 
and you could get a regular Ranger for weekday duty. So if you wanted to take and spend $90,000 on a Raptor, you've got an interesting choice. You could just buy one Bronco or you could buy one of these. You could do a lot of mods. You could put 35s on it, jack it up, do whatever you wanted to do, put lots of crazy off-road specific stuff on it, and then buy a regular Ranger for your regular Ranger duties. This one as equipped right here is about $57,000 and it's about as fully loaded as anybody is really going to get right from the factory. This is actually a little bit less expensive than less powerful competitors. If you take a look at a Jeep Gladiator, for instance, it gets pretty darn expensive and it has nowhere near this amount of power under the hood. Now the Gladiator, it's a pretty different kind of truck. Obviously it's a Wrangler truck, so it's a convertible with removable doors, etc. Yeah, you could unbolt these doors, but they're not really meant to go on and off. It's gonna have a lot less power. It is still gonna have front and rear lockers, but it's really more of a rock crawling focused vehicle, especially with that really aggressive low ratio mode in the Rubicon model. And interestingly enough, I would argue that something like the Colorado, the Canyon, the Tacoma, the Frontier, etc., those off-road focused trims of those options, they're actually a little bit more similar in the way that they're designed for that kind of off-roading. This is a bit more like, obviously, the rest of the Raptor lineup. So Baja style running where you get more power and you need that extra power, that's what you want this truck for. If you're simply rock crawling, this is gonna be just fine at that, but there are other options that are gonna be just about as good. If you want high speed performance though, on the road, off the road, in Baja, wherever you want that 405 horsepower to do its thing for you, you want this. And this is certainly the quickest truck in this segment. We haven't been able to test this at home. Keep that in mind. Our numbers are just preliminary, but this is definitely really, really quick. And again, outside of that price point, which is probably going to have some dealer markups in the first year, this is definitely a really good deal. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Also, let's have a lottery. What do you think the average dealer markup is going to be on this Ranger Raptor when it does go on sale? I'm guessing maybe five to $10,000 from some dealers, although Ford has been really aggressive at trying to knock those dealer markups down. So I suspect actually that you will be able to find a reasonable number of dealers that won't have any dealer markup at all on the Bronco, sorry, on the Ranger Raptor. There's so many Raptors here, they're confusing in my head. Anyway, let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Hit us up at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those other social places, and which way would you get your Ranger? I have to admit, even though I don't necessarily want the off-road capability that we find in this model, I think I would rather have some slightly less aggressive all-terrain tires as a daily driver, I do love the power and I love the suspension tune in this truck. This is the best riding Ranger, and for a lot of folks, I think that's gonna be reason enough to simply choose this over a Lariat or an XLT, if you have the cash. See all of you later.